This is Mark Sullivan. This is the Breakdown Show. Yeah, Break you got to let it come. Yeah, it's all right. You've got, well, I'll get it for you. The uh, the Break It Down Show is proud to have yeah. Mark Sullivan on the show. Uh, it's it's incredible. You When you're an author, you say, oh, I want to be an author. A lot of people have. It's a dream job you know, that you've got. And at some point, you get elevated above the level of, of needing to just sell books to survive. And you get to do things like write with some of your heroes and pick the stories a little more carefully. We've had a lot of very successful authors on the show. But I was looking at your your list of books. And Mark, it's just, I mean, if no one's told you today, thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for telling these incredible yeah. stories. Thank and so and uh, congratulations on building a, a real steady, solid career as a writer. I mean, what's what's better than, it's like someone writes about you. He was a writer in Bozeman, Montana, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And sure. then the adventure begins. Yeah, it's a total miracle that I get to do this. And I'm cognizant of that every day. I wake up every day thrilled that I get to do what I do. One of my uh, one of the show, friends of the show is a guy named Jim D. Felice. I imagine you know who Jim is at least uh, yeah. professionally. And mm -hmm. I, I love to ask this question. He had a great answer one time. When you know being number one on the New York Times bestseller list is you know it's one thing to say you're a bestseller. That's a whole different level. He's done mm -hmm. the same thing. But there are day to day things that you do where you're like, oh, look at Mark Sullivan now. I'm doing X. You know, this is here I am, this world famous author. You know, person. Yeah. What, what's what are those moments for you? Like when you just go, <laughs> if they can see me now, you know. Uh, it's very humbling, really. I I consistently pinch myself because I know what the odds are of getting here and um, I'm grateful for it. Every day I, I get to go up, get up, do exactly what I want to do. Um, I love writing. I love being a novelist. So it's, it's, it's a total miracle. And I do pinch myself because I know there are a lot of really talented people out there who don't get the kind of shots that I've gotten. So. Yeah, but you've also earned it. I mean, you don't get to have James Patterson, you know, as a partner on on a novel if you're not mm -hmm. doing it well. What what is a day in the life like for you? I mean, as you try to figure out how am I going to write this next book, what sure. are you a sixteen hour iron asser or what do you what do you do? I used to be. Uh, now uh -huh. I'm up. I'm up at six a.m. I meditate. I'm a belie big believer in meditation for creative people. Uh, I work out after that. I usually, if I'm here in uh, a Big Sky, I in the winter, I'll ski for an hour, and then I come in uh, before eleven and I lock my door. I turn off all the internet and my telephone, and I write for anywhere between four and five hours uh, every day. And uh, but I do it every day, seven days a week when I'm writing. It's the only way I can sort of stay connected to the book. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I'm a really boring guy. You know, I'll, I'll read at night or I'll watch a movie with my wife and my kids. Uh, and I get up and do it again the same way the next day. I've found that that routine is critical. So you're less about the process and more about prepping yourself to sit down on that chair. And you, I guess you, you, I like to say, like, we find elegance as we get older and mm -hmm. uh, we don't we work harder or smarter, not harder. I mean, you're still working right. hard, yes. but you you realize the focus can't be a hundred percent, 16 hours in the chair kind of focus. No, I think that's necessary when you're a young writer, just to get it and to, to get into that space where you're really producing well. Um, I know how to get there. And this is, you know, it's just by routine. I know that if I meditate, if I work out, if I spend some time outside, um, it usually leads to a really good writing session. And the crazy thing is things that used to take me 10 to 15 hours a day now take me four to five. And you're exactly right. You, you learn to work smartly versus just showing up and spending a lot of time in the chair. Right. And a lot of redrafting and redraft. Not that you probably don't have to rewrite things, but you're a lot closer to the final product when you start now, I'm assuming. Yes, I am, because I do a lot of uh, outlining. I think a lot about the book before I start. So by the time I'm actually writing, I'm trying to be the best writer I can. I've already worked out the, the drama and the storytelling. Um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Let's. Uh, I want to back up a little bit. You write a lot of different kinds of books. You use <laughs> history. You, you do thrillers. Um, do you have a preference between fiction and nonfiction? Like, do you... 
Do you have a home genre? It seems like you move around quite a bit. Do you have a home genre? Well, I'm always a fiction writer these days, unless I'm writing for a magazine. Um, historical fiction allows me to take, you know, actual true events and true people and write about them in a very dramatic way, which I love doing. Um, up till Beneath a Scarlet Sky, which was my most recent book, um, I was writing thrillers and mystery novels, and I love every single one of them. Uh, but to write the historical fiction, I had to take my writing in a completely different direction. Uh, it was a huge challenge, but I found out I'm pretty good at it, um, at making the past come alive. And I, I really enjoy that. I think it's absolutely fascinating. And What's the, the story? You know, yeah. The storytelling skills definitely come from writing mysteries and thrillers because – you know, you have to be efficient. You can't dawdle. You got to take people in as quickly as you can. And I found that that training really helped me with historical fiction. When you when you look at a story like, uh, well, let's just let's just take your current. Well, no, let, we'll go back. We'll back one book and under the scarlet mm -hmm. sky. This yeah. is uh, based on an actual person who who is still alive. Are you still alive, right? Um, yeah, he's still alive. You know, Lelo, he'll be ninety three on June first. I'd, I'd love to talk to that guy on the show if he's still capable of doing that. We can link that up or not. But uh, yeah. it, it's just in these incredible people. And so often in stories, um, we we use Nazis as like the universal heel for all things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you you don't seem to be willing to kind of – it's it's become tropey. Look, Nazis are horrible. We don't want to celebrate them at all. But, you know, they, they become this mythic bad guy. And you're kind of using this, especially in your current book, The Last Green Valley. Uh, you don't use them in that traditional way. Like there's, uh, this is a man against the machine kind of story, I think, in both cases. Yes, that's true. And, you know, I am of the belief that no one is purely evil. I mean, there are probably exceptions, you know, a handful in history. Um, but people do, you, people who are good people do bad things. And, that's what I've been playing with, you know, with these characters who are, you know, based on real people. But I was able to introduce them uh, and talk to them and find their relatives enough to find out that they had different sides to their personalities, right? Uh, General Layers, who's the um, antagonist of sorts in Beneath the Scarlet Sky, he's aptly named. He has layer after layer after layer. Some are good, some are bad. And I think that's uh, one of the strengths of the story. Um, you know, the same thing in the last Green Valley, the Nazis are complicated. Um, some of them are quite bad. Uh, you know, that the, the character of the of the captain in the book, the last Green Valley, I mean, he was an actual Holocaust perpetrator in the Ukraine. He was part of what was called the Holocaust of Bullets, which is, I didn't understand this, that the final solution really started when Hitler invaded Russia. Um, everything before then had been set up to go in that direction. Uh, and they originally started just by having firing squads. And then they found out that they couldn't handle the volume with firing squads and they moved on. Yeah, that's, uh, they moved on. And it's, again, like when you're like in the last Green Valley, and I guess we talk about that now but mm -hmm. when you're between two machines you're in a rock and a hard place you don't yeah. trust either of them bastards mm -hmm. you know you've got to make so many like i'm a combat veteran and there's so many times where you don't even just make a decision you don't have the time and the luxury to figure out what's the best choice you just have that's to right. act because there's, right. just, there's no time for sorting that out and that's exactly what happens to the martels who are the protagonists of the last green valley and they're uh, were real people. Uh, I know their sons very well and was able to interview them at length. And I lucked out that I had, uh, there were recordings of them being interviewed and uh, I was able to listen to all that, work with them. But right at the beginning of the book, which is takes place in March of 1944, they're faced with this terrible decision. Um, do they stay in the Ukraine where their family has been living for over a hundred years as ethnic Germans brought there to uh, sow and harvest wheat for Catherine the Great. Do they stay? Because after the Bolsheviks came, they got thrown off their land. They were starved. Uh, they were treated horribly. And then Hitler invades and says, do you want your land back? And they said, sure. 
And so they work on it for about 18 months until Stalin counterattacks. And when Stalin counterattacks, they know uh, that they're in trouble because uh, they'll probably be sent to Siberia if not hung. Uh, so they have this choice. Do they stay and wait for the Soviet bear to return? Or do they run with the Nazis they've come to despise, uh, but who have promised to keep them safe? And so they run with the Nazis with their intent is they're going to break off from them at some point and try to get to the Allied lines. Um, so it's it's one of the more amazing stories I've ever heard. And uh, I, I loved writing it. It was tremendous challenge and fun and all in the same thing. Do you have to go to Ukraine and these other places to kind of get up? Yeah. Okay, talk about yeah, that. I retrace this. Yeah. So um, I retraced their migration route, which they did in a covered wagon, by the way, with two horses and two kids and everything they could shove in the wagon. And they take off on what's essentially a 1400 mile journey. And they're caught between the two armies. And so I went and retraced that route. Uh, I started in Ukraine with the brothers who are still alive. And we were able to uh, track back to the ruins of the farmhouse where the story begins. And, and that was incredible uh, for them to see the whole cycle of their life right in front of them, to know that they had run when they were four and six, and they remembered it. And, uh, and then we were able to go to the gulag where they were, their father was held. And to see them go into the basement of this museum where they were held uh, as prisoners of war was just incredible for them because you know he went into that gulag with 2,000 other men and when he escapes there are only 200 left and he knows he's going to die because the thing is rampant with disease and he he makes this remarkable move and escapes and I was able to track all that um, through I went from Ukraine through uh, Moldova, Romania, Hungary, uh, up to Poland, and then backtracked back all the way to the border with Belarus where um, Mr. Martel was held. And it really gave me a sense of the epic scope of what they had gone through, you know. We often focus on Western Europe in most of our European knowledge, and we'll, we'll attribute, you know, a lot of things just to the English as a default. It's they, they get the most notoriety so that they get everything. But when you sure. get to Eastern Europe and you see that people still use a donkey and a cart, granted there's, mm -hmm. you know, car tires on that cart now. But yep. if you, you think about that, like we sort of have that here with the Amish, but this is a way of life for, for everybody in you know, not everybody, but lots of people in Romania, in the Baltic states, in, in the Balkans. Yes. It's a yes. different world, you know, and mm -hmm. it's very same as it was 100 years ago. Well, you can see the effects of communism everywhere there. You know, there's a drabness to the architecture. But once you get out into the countryside, you do see people who are living the same way the Martels lived, uh, you know, with some obvious improvements like rubber tires and things of this nature. Right. Um yeah, and it really gave me a sense of the vastness of Ukraine. It, when you see it, especially from the air, uh, you just realize it's all agriculture, right, outside of the big cities. And it's one of the big bread baskets of the world. And so you can see why everybody valued it from Catherine the Great to Stalin to Hitler. They all wanted it because they knew that that was where the food was coming from. And you couldn't expand into these areas of a greater Germany or an expanding um, you know, Soviet Union. Uh, they needed it. If they didn't have it, they were gonna, their people were going to starve. Yep. When you talk to the, the family and other folks in Ukraine, how do they perceive their history? I mean, you know, it's, it's like the Balkans where everybody runs through it on the way to somewhere else, right? It becomes yeah. this resource because they are valuable. How do they perceive their, like, what does it mean to be Ukrainian? Oh boy, I don't know. Um, I think it was interesting. The women there were uniformly sharp and well-rounded and they, they loved the modern Ukraine. A lot of the men I met, um, they were sort of bitter. Some of them, including my guide, he, he said he was better off under communism, uh, which really surprised me. Uh, you know, that you have to remember also that there was a massive brain drain 
out of that part of the uh, of the world because Stalin and Lenin they basically if you oppose them they shipped you to a to a gulag or they killed you and right. um, like Mrs. Martell's father was taken when she was twelve never heard from again vanished Mr. Martell's father was also sent to Siberia and he did manage to come back but he was a broken person uh, so it it. It's a very conflicted place is what I guess I'm saying. The history of it is conflicted because there's a lot of bitterness and regret there. And at the same time, young people, you know, they love it because it's it's come out of that world and it's making progress constantly. Yeah, I mean, you think about the Martels having to make that choice. You're always stuck between the Russians and the Germans, at least in, from their point of view. And, and that's, that's all there is to it. Yeah. And so ultimately you know, you have to leave your homeland and you may never, it's war. You may never come back. You, you may not want to come back, but you right. have to leave everything. And so I guess the allies are the best bet, but, but are the allies as benevolent as, as we want them to be as, as you know, the main, you know, tent pole on the uh, allied tent or well, is this, this like yeah. better than nothing? Yeah. Well, I think it's a little bit of better than nothing because remember the Soviets were part of the allied forces and there was a pinch and, but they knew what life was like under communism and they wanted out and they were running. So they were going to take any possible way to get out of the way of the Soviet bear. And they ran with the wolves. And, you know, it's it's like anything from that period, when you start digging into it, it gets really complicated. It gets morally murky almost immediately. And I think to their great credit is they realized that it was their only chance. And so they basically cut all ties to their land and they ran. Um, what's amazing to me, obviously, is how they can go through this incredibly brutal journey and then be separated and, you know, the husband and wife separated and then go on another brutal journey, each of them alone. Mom with the two boys and, and dad in the gulag that he has to escape from. And, you know, the fact that he makes it all the way you know, to the British sector only to find out that she's on the wrong side of the line. She's in the Soviet sector. And so she has to escape with the boys. And when I heard this story, I was just dumbfounded because the Martells are very successful people. They, you know, once they got to the United States and once they got to Bozeman, Montana, where I live, I'm like literally everything they touched turned to gold because and I, it, I attribute it directly to how hard they worked. I mean, <clears throat> in their early life, they worked incredibly hard just to survive, right? And they did this all the time. They get to the United States where there's opportunity and they're working just as hard, right? But all of a sudden, the rewards of their hard efforts start to come. Yeah. And I think it's an incredibly inspiring story. And it's an amazingly American story, right? This is a story of people who... America brought in, who basically accepted them and gave them a new life as refugees. And boy, what they did once once America gave them the chance was just remarkable. How exceptional are the Martels from the World War II era? I mean, are there thousands of families like this? I mean, I know they're not singular. There's no way. No, no, there are thousands and thousands, thousands just like them. You know, mm -hmm. people who are ethnic Germans uh, who lived in Eastern Europe who they were expulsed by all the countries, including the Soviet Union, including Poland, all these places expulsed them. So like at one point, about a year after the war ends, roughly 20, not, not even a year, like four months after the war ends, 20 million Germans start walking to Germany. And Germany couldn't keep them. There, you know, there was no room for them. Some of them settled in Germany, but a lot of them went to Canada, went to the United States, went to South America. But yeah, that you know, it's amazing how many people were uprooted and moved around because of World War II. And you know, that's what really fascinated me about the Martel story is, is I was less interested in telling a war story than I was telling a story of a family trying to get out of the way of a war. Yeah. Right? They they had no stake in the thing. They were just trying to get out of the way. And um, I found that fascinating, you know, and I was able to depict that thing that way in a meaningful way, I think. 
when you did this, so we had a guy named Lou Bashevsky on, and his grandpa uh, rode in a tank from Normandy all the way until the end. Like he just kept going, and their tank survived. That's pretty remarkable. And so that he is. went out on Lou, his grandson, went on his bicycle and followed that path through Europe. And his grandpa remembered a story where late in the night they're in a the field and a cow steps on a mine, kaboom, and the cow blows up. And he's like, it wow. was this crazy thing. His cow dies. And so he goes through and he finds a lady by happenstance. She actually finds him. And she's like, well, one thing I remember is that our cow got blown up in this field. And he has this impossible confluence of things where yeah. you're like, oh, my God, they remember the same moment. It's his mm -hmm. grandpa come back to life. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything like that where you're like, how in the world, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, I met this guy in Romania right on the border with Moldova. And he at the time, he was like... 96 he's 100 yeah. now he's still alive wow and yeah i mean amazing he was the beekeeper he he I mean, it had a heavy influence on the book because he was one of the more enlightened people i've ever met in my life he had just this extraordinary connection and with me immediately and i could feel it and he started telling me about you know he was a romanian soldier and he was on the border when the ethnic Germans came through. He remembered it. And, and then, you know, the, the, the Romanian government flipped sides, right? They, they were uh, uh, with the Germans against the Soviets, and yet they turn, and now all of a sudden they're with the Soviets because he can see the writing on the wall. So he's told to surrender. And when he goes to surrender, they take him and throw him in a prison camp. And yeah. uh, he spends four and a half years in a prison camp, escapes three times, and finally gets sent to a maximum security camp. And he uh, uh, he manages to come out with this dream that he holds on to, which is of being a beekeeper. And that's what his obsession was. He was fascinated by bees. He was convinced that bees would give him a long life, which they did. Uh, you know, he's over 100 years old, and he's still sharp which was just incredible. So there was that. And, and that was fortuitous because before Mr. Martell goes into the gulag, he, uh, he, he's the kind of guy who doesn't want to be noticed, right? He's grown up under the um, uh, communist regime and he knows that if you, if you stick out or if you excel at something, you're probably going to get sent away. And so he becomes the kind of guy who doesn't want to be noticed and very, very little ambition other than surviving. But he goes to the camp and he escapes. And when he escapes, he's a different person, right? He, he yeah. sees opportunity everywhere. He takes risks constantly. And this carries through not only the long escape, you know, because he had to go all the way back to Germany, right? He got sent back farther than he started. And he has to make it all the way back, which he does. And yeah. from that point forward, he's a total entrepreneur. And the boys couldn't explain it. And they said, you're going to have to explain it. So the way I explained it is he meets somebody very much like, you know, Corporal Georgi. And uh, that man changes his life. When you have this much improbable survival, they have to be strong religious people. Like there's no way that they don't think the hand of God was on them all the time. I mean, oh, it, it's, absolutely. You're, you're, you're bound to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. There are people of profound faith and deep faith, faith that was tested, right? Uh, all the time uh, during this thing. So at one point he's lost his faith and at another point she's losing her faith, but they managed to cling to the last shreds of it. And it turns out, and because of that, they became, you know, incredibly devout. She especially, Adele especially, Adeline especially. She um, was a profoundly faithful Lutheran. Uh, she went to church all the time in Bozeman. And um, she basically said, without God, they never would have made it. You think about that today, you know, and we're so godless and there's, you know, we're, we're so in charge of our destiny. I don't know that we... Um, we have the moments that, you know, have some fear of God to have some spiritual responsibility. It just left us to mm -hmm. our own devices to leave me alone. And, and I don't know that the Martells would recognize that. Like if they were young right now, you know, and you transported them in a time machine, I wonder how they would deal with all of that. Or would they just keep working and not worry about it? I don't know. 
I think they would keep working. I don't think they would worry about other people's faith. Um, they're very independent minded. I know that their their grandchildren are are you know very religious, still are Lutherans, and uh, <laughs> Walter's son, especially Charlie. Um, so it was passed down, and they all the grandkids remember their grandparents uh, as being incredibly faithful people. Same true for Pino. Is he also because his survival is so? I mean, Pino impossible to is him. an interesting guy. He he's he. I would describe him as a spiritual person that's not very religious. You okay. know, he he still he realizes that a lot of his life, especially during the two years of the war, were a miracle. Um, some of it was brutal miracle, but it was a miracle nonetheless. And you know, he taught me a lot about how we deal with tragedy as, as human beings, everybody has to go through it and grief. And it was always that you get through it by recognizing that we, the only thing that happens is change. It's constant. Mm. And, and the more you embrace that and you're grateful for the people who come into your life and grateful for the people who exit your life, um, it, it's the best way to live your life in the long run. And that, that's what I learned from him. He changed my life profoundly. And the Martell story did too, because I I saw again and again and again in their story that they never gave up. They just never gave up. And that alone will get you a long way in life. And uh, I, ev all the lessons that I got from Pino Lella were certainly reinforced by the Martell story. How does Pino reckon with the fact that he works for one of the top Nazis? How does, does that I mean, he's not a Nazi, right? He's there not by choice. No. He's there because of war. But how does he deal with that? Well, he he suffers with it, right? He he almost loses his best friend because he thinks he's gone Nazi. He's doing it because his parents were convinced he was going to be sent to the Russian front and he was going to die and they didn't want him to die for the Germans. Uh, so they had him uh, volunteer for an organization, the organization Tote which is the least understood part of the Nazi war machine. It was like a combination of uh, the quartermaster's corps and the army corps of engineers. They built stuff. Uh, they commandeered stuff. Uh, they ran the factories. They were in charge of war production is what their title was. And, you know, he sort of blunders into it. His parents make him volunteer because they know he's going to be put in a non-combat role. And then through a series of remarkable circumstances, he becomes this general's driver. Now, Pino is an amazing driver. I can attest to that myself, having driven with him. Uh, scared the bejesus out of me within 20 minutes of meeting him, uh, driving through the streets of uh, northern Italy in his car. Uh, and that became you know, crucial because you know, if you've read the book, uh, he's an amazing driver. And I can attest that he is an amazing driver. So he gets the job with the general by a fluke, and all of a sudden he's going with this guy everywhere, seeing what the Germans are building and able to pass that information on to uh, um, the, the, the partisans through his uncle and the radio that they had, and it got out to the Allies. So he was very divided on working for the general. Uh, he can tell you as many stories about the general where he was bad is when he was good. So he's, he, it depends on the day when I would talk to yeah. him. Was he a good guy? Was he a bad guy? And the truth is yeah. he was both. You know? Yeah. Like everybody, right. We had, um, uh, the, one of the moms from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was on the show and her name's Vivian. And I mean, that's, that's her um, show name, but uh, Daphne's her real name. She was saying like, you know, Bill Cosby is my friend. You know, he's done so much for the black community, especially in Hollywood and in, around the nation. You know, however, he's also done these horrible things. But, mm -hmm. you know, you have to balance this good and evil. And it, it's never just boom. Like you said earlier, it's never just one thing. It's never just uh, one The same thing. thing goes true for Saddam Hussein. We had uh, a guy named Kelly, he Kelly Heilier, and he was the, the personal jailer for Saddam Hussein, you know, going through the trial. And his job from the American side, from an international side, was to keep him calm, go through the process without a whole lot of drama and drawing attention to himself. So keep him chilled out. Let's get this over with, you know? Right. Um, and he's like, yeah, Saddam was my friend. I cried when he died. I also know what kind of a monster he was, you know? And so you right. have these, 
this conflicting thing because we want someone to be just universally bad, you know. But you have yeah. a guy like Layers, and it depends on the day, depends on the moment. Depends on the moment. I mean, you know, ultimately, people have asked me, what do I think motivated Layers? And I think it was undoubtedly Layers. He was looking out for himself at all times. And, you know, he was trying to make sure that he was going to go back home to his family. Which is you 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 can't argue with that, right? I mean, that's just the basic human condition. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't think people are all one way or another. You know, despite what social media will have you believe these days, you know, where yeah. somebody is all one thing. If they've done one thing, it's their life. They're canceled. And it's over. And you know, first of all, our legal system doesn't work that way, and neither should you know the court of public opinion, in my belief. Yeah, when we deal in in doubt, reasonable doubt, we don't deal in in you know hard truths hardly ever. Those things typically don't go to trial. You know, if you That's know, right. you know. Yeah. The, the, the thing with layers is he survives and gets through Nuremberg and all that stuff too, right? He doesn't even get to Nuremberg. He's in jailed and he's waiting trial. And then because of a number of societal and and global factors, uh, largely, it had to do with the fact that people, the historians, believe that. People were just sick of the war by the time the, the two years of the Nuremberg trials were going on. And when they were getting ready to do the Italian trials, you know, there was a number of other things because Italy was starting to trend communist. Uh, and people believed that if they uh, put these things on trials, it would only strengthen the communist hands. Were there trials in Italy? Yeah, there were a few, but not what there should have been because there were atrocities that went on all over Italy during the Nazi occupation. Did Pino have any interaction with uh, General Layers after the war? No, he had no idea what happened to him after that lap final scene on the Brenner Pass. I went and found his granddaughter, or his daughter, and was able to talk to her um, briefly because she was very ill when I talked to her, but I was able to talk to his aide and to his minister. And they were able to give me a lot of uh, I interesting information about him. He was uh, very, much involved in his town and contributed to it. He had an estate. No one really knew where all the money came from that he used to restore it. His wife had inherited it, but that's they lived there. And he ends up building a church in the town. And there are all sorts of things about him that, again, are incredibly positive. And yet, you know, he did run a slave army in Italy. There's no doubt about it. So, you know, how do you judge those two things? And one of the ways he said is, you know, and I got this from either the aide or the minister, I can't remember, is that, you know, he believed in being the man behind the scenes. He did not want to be out front. He wanted to be pulling the levers of power without, you know, being out front because being out front like that gets you killed. And he didn't want that. You know. And the same thing applies uh, you know, standard Nazi caveat applies here too, but the same thing applies for a guy like uh, Layers is that he is a man in a situation, you know, the war starts and he's high enough ranked that, you know, your opportunity to leave is very limited. And then just because you leave doesn't mean that you survive the, the, the walk across the lines. And then also when you interact yeah. with the Americans, you know, you're as likely to get shot as, as, you know, surrendered and, and safely transitioned. I mean, you just, you don't know. And so you're trying to decide your best bet. It doesn't forgive the atrocity, but like everybody else, they're all trying to get through the next 20 minutes. I mean, I've been to combat. There's people that are like every day I was worried mm -hmm. that I was going to die every moment. You know, I was right. looking for something that was coming so I could react yep. to it. Right. That's true for everybody in those situations. Sure. Sure. I mean, you know, at near the end of the war, I mean, he's going to Switzerland all the time. We don't know who he was meeting with. We know that, um, you know, from Pino's perspective, he was smuggling gold you know, into Switzerland. Um, his bank accounts were frozen in the immediate post-war, but then unfrozen about three hour, three years later, which allowed him access to the money, um, which we have no idea how it got there. Uh, um, you know, Pino will tell you how he got there, but you know, do we have exact information on how it was there? No. Um, but yeah, he's a super complicated character and certainly the most challenging character I've ever had to write uh, just because I wanted to give you a broad view of him. Uh, there were other things about him.
that didn't make it into their book because at a certain point the book was like 850 pages long <laughs> and you know it 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 came to the point where if pino wasn't there it didn't go in the book right. so there's evidence that that layers helped uh, uh, a musician in Vienna, in um, not Vienna, in uh, Venice, uh, who was Jewish. He helped him, you know, get to safety. Um, there's some evidence that he was involved in prison swaps. Uh, that he was told to kill partisans, he didn't do it. Instead, swapped them with the, his, so he could get back his own prisoners. Mm. Um, but again, Pino wasn't there, so it, it ended up on the cutting room floor. What about things that don't make it into the last green Valley or the things like that as well? Uh, well, I, I had to truncate certain things, right? Because when they, to my mind, the real book ends when they're reunited and that everything after that is just explaining what happened to them after their great journey. So I'm not, I didn't go into the blow by blow of what they had to go through to get, into America, you know, right? Because they had to have sponsors and and to be willing to bring them and put them to work. And it's a little bit in there, but I didn't go into the nuance of it. Um, so it's truncated toward the end. So you're getting a sense of, you know, what happened to them in the long flow of their life afterwards. Uh, so that kind of, some of that stuff ended up on the floor, certainly. When you're using fiction to help the story along, I mean, you're doing so much work on the historical side, but you say based on and historical novel. This indicates that you're using a little bit of license to to make the story, you know, even sure. better. But sure. how, how do you sprinkle that in? So the first thing I have to do is recognize that, like with, with Beneath the Scarlet Sky and similarly uh, with The Last Green Valley, how are you going to recreate conversations from 60 and 70 years ago? You know, you're right. just not. Um, so that has to be fictional. You know what the intent of the conversation was. So that's fictional. Um, you know, you, I, I tend to cut out the slack parts, which are part of any life, and bring it to the head. So, you know, you're seeing the, the Martells at their moments of greatest challenge in that book. Um, there are times where you see them at family life, et cetera. But the, the fact of the matter is that, that their life was so intense during that time. Um, you have to write in a way that gives the reader an incredibly strong sense of how that must have felt. My goal when I write historical fiction is to put the reader right on the shoulders of the main characters and to let them experience what they experienced uh, on the page, right? They're they're getting it. They're getting the story, and they're feeling the emotions that these people went through, and the incredible trials that they went through, right? And that's what my goal is always: is to try to show you people who lived a story that is inherently inspirational, right? Moving perhaps healing and perhaps transformational to the reader. And that's what I was after, you know, cause I'll give you an example. After um, I wrote Beneath the Scarlet Sky and it was published and, you know, I was blessed to have it become a runaway bestseller. People said, you know, you'll never find another story like that. And I was yeah. like, no, I actually think I will, you know? And, uh, and then sure enough, the story started coming out of the woodwork. All people writing me like, write about this, write about my grandmother, write about my great uncle. He did this. And and they were all fascinating, you know, but I realized I was going to have to have a filter. What was I looking for? And I went back and really thought about Beneath the Scarlet Sky. And I said, the reason it has impacted so many people is that the story is inherently moving. It's yeah. inspirational. It's healing. And it transformed me and it's transformed lots of people around the world, which is incredibly gratifying, you know? Um, so I looked for that kind of story. That was the filter, moving, inspirational, healing, transformational um, to the reader. And I was hearing stories that almost got there, but yeah. they, they just didn't take it. And then I'm at a, uh, uh, I'm giving a talk at the Noontime Rotary in my hometown in Bozeman, Montana. And this guy comes up afterwards and he says, do you know who the Martells are? And they own a big construction company in, in Montana. And I said, well, I know who Seriously, they are, but I don't know them. Yep. Yeah. 
And uh, he said, the whole time I was reading Beneath the Scarlet Sky, all I could think of was the Martell story. You have to hear it. So two days later, you know, I put Bill Martell's um, address in my nav, and it's like two miles from my house. And then I drive down, and it tells me to take a left into this little neighborhood, and I get this bizarre feeling. And I couldn't put my finger on it <clears throat> until I get to uh, Bill Martell's driveway. And I realize I can't be 250 yards from where I heard Pino Wella. It's the same little neighborhood. You know, wow. and I knock on the door and Bill invites me in. And within 10 minutes, I'm sitting forward in my chair. And within an hour, I know I'm doing it. I just, it's it's what I was looking for. It had that, you know, quality of showing you what the human spirit is capable of. And, I, you know, in this day and age, given what we've all gone through in the past year, I think we need to hear more of these stories, not less of them. You know, I, uh, it's, I totally agree. It's easy to go. Yeah. It's easy to go to the, the stories that are inherently depressing and that, you know, are awful and there's no redeeming value to them. But I find that the stories of the people who go through this and don't break, who hold on to their spirit, who rely on it, that's the kind of story I want to hear. And so those are the kinds of stories I want to write. Yeah, because humans are incredible. And uh, you can say whatever you want about social this or whatever that. I believe in people. And I believe that you deserve your shot. And you may not make it. Heck, you may die because you take that shot. Mm -hmm. But yep. the Martells are just one of millions of examples of people coming to this great country. I saw a story on 60 Minutes about a contract company that focuses on kids with autism. And I mean, you know, they're, they're functional, but this is severe autism. But what they're yeah. great at is focusing at a level that someone who doesn't have autism isn't able to do. So they're able to give them these complex tasks, but they're, mm -hmm. you can be autistic and come here and make six figures, you know, go do that in yeah, a sure. lot of other countries. And it's just, it's just not possible. You really can outwork. 99% of your problems in most cases. And and that's an incredible opportunity. And I, I'm glad that you tell these stories because we're, we have this perception of ourselves that, that we don't like immigrants and it's it, far from the truth. Like that's my, I always say my favorite American we're is all immigrants. Story. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you know, these are the people who the immigrants are the ones who come and they have faced unreal adversity to get here. Right. And what do they right. do when they get here? They, they, put their back into it and they work phenomenally so that their children gets the American way of life. And I don't know, I, I can't help but applaud anybody who takes the risk to flee a life that's horrible to try to make a better life. And, yeah. you know, that is the story of the Martells. And ultimately it's the story of every, an ancestor of every single one of us who's lucky enough to live here. You know, yeah, my, you, you, my, ans my own ancestor came from Ireland to Canada, down into Vermont, um, started a life, was uh, volunteered as part of the uh, Union Army in the Civil War, ends up dying at the Battle of uh, Baton Rouge, and but has seven kids, and his wife raises them all, and they yield my family. Yeah, which is just incredible. You know? it, it is incredible. What's also incredible, and I believe this is still true, um, President Tyler has living grandkids, not great grandkids, grandkids. And so that's how young this country is. And you look at how remarkable it can be. You know, we're talking three generations. Granted, it's really long lifetimes with, yes. you know, extremes for, but, but those two dudes are still around. There's two of them, not just one, two. And so that's yeah. how short the, the history is here. It's it's just a couple of lifetimes, and you get all the way back to the I don't know what it, you know he was president. Those guys were around when uh, when Andrew Jackson was president. You know um, that's crazy. It's crazy. William Henry Harrison, yes. right? That's that guy was. Mm -hmm. You know his dad signed the Declaration of Independence. You know that's mm -hmm. that's how young of a country you are, and and. Tyler took over for Harrison, right? So mm -hmm. it's it's crazy. Yeah. I wanted to talk about back into the main book here, um, not not beneath the sky, but the Last Green Valley. When yep. you look at that story, is that the last World War II story for you, or do you think that there's something else out there? And I want to say this before you answer. I, I went to the World War One Museum 
And for some reason, it doesn't stick like World War II. But I asked um, some of the people that work there, I'm like, how many stories are in this place? And they're like, oh, my God. Like, oh, it's sure. a worldwide war. The love letters, the stories, all this stuff, the archives. Yeah. Like, you could tell stories about World War One forever. Yes. So um, I could tell stories about World War One and probably World War II forever. Uh, but my criteria is I want stories that, are inherently moving, inspirational, healing, transformational. And I, I, you know, I've, I've been looking since the last green Valley and another story showed up and it's not world war two. It takes place in Uganda. Uh, it's the story of a 13 year old boy and an 11, 12 year old girl who get kidnapped by a guy named Joseph Coney. And they're turned into child soldiers. And it's horrendous what they go through. And yet they meet after five years. They're in different parts of this Lord, Lord's Resistance Army. And they fall in love. And they, by falling in love, they manage to survive and then escape. And it's just an incredible story. And it was brought to me by a former uh, commander of SEAL Team 6, who is a friend of my son's. And he said, I've got a story for you. And as soon as I heard it, you know, I was like, okay, this is, it meets all the criteria. I've never heard a story like it. And I'm going to go do it. And um, so I'm going to Uganda in about six weeks to spend a month with them. Um, they're still alive. And of course, and, uh, I can't wait. I think it's going to be a tremendous story. We we uh, we have such a small bit of knowledge about boy soldiers and what it's like to live in Africa. You know, I, I know people from you know, different special forces elements that have gone there and dealt with that. And they're like, mm -hmm. they're me. You know, they they parents were both dead. They were left to their own devices. The military came along and said, "Here's how we're going to do this, and this is how they survive, and they become something." You know, yes. And, uh, yes. It's easy to swap uniforms, and all of a sudden you're them. It's that understanding, yep. and that's the thing I learned in combat. Is like people, you have to accept people for where they are and how they got there, because you, you just can't mm -hmm. put, you know, your own morals and, and norms on them, because it's it's not fair to them, and it wouldn't be fair fair for them to do it to you especially if you're trying to change what they're doing you know you have to understand. oh yeah yeah well i mean uh our friend the seal team commander he told me that these kids were trained harder than any seal yeah he said i don't think i could have done it what they went through at their age and you know what what they had to do to survive because of course they're told immediately that their parents are dead yeah. which was not true in this situation. It was not true. Some of them were, some of them were killed by the, you know, the, the armies and the kidnappers, but um, Florence and uh, Anthony were not dead. They didn't know this for years. Uh, they were, you know, they had convinced them that their parents were dead. Um, and yet the, the amazing thing about them is they managed to hold on to their humanity the entire time. Yeah. They don't turn into zombies. And, and a lot of it is by faith. You know, they're Catholics, uh, both of them, and um, they managed to hold on to their faith. And then when they met each other and fell in love, that became their strength. And that became the thing that gets them out is by basically becoming more human, not less. That's how they yeah, survive. That's that's remarkable. And you're right. The um, you know, every seal I think I've talked to said they got through buds because they were willing to die to do it. And so if, yep. if they think what these other African soldiers are doing is similar, then they're all willing to to live to do it. Like mm -hmm. this is how they mm -hmm. live, and yep. it doesn't matter what you throw at them, and they're either going to die or not. And you lose you lose control of that, and you just you just mm -hmm. work, and you're not yep. you're not out there bloodlusting. At least not initially. You know you might get there, but that's mm -hmm. that's a different story. I, I love it. I yep. want to take John Turz's question and throw this at you. Mark, want, uh, John wants to know if Mark has any advice. Or suggestion for potential writers. I mean, you're so far up Rider Mountain and so successful. How do you get up the lower part of the, the foothills of the mountains? Uh, the first thing is to make it your um, craft that you practice every day. Uh, you know, the number one thing I tell writers who come up to me and ask or aspiring writers is I, I always tell them spend the same amount of time every day writing, even if it's only an hour, do it. 
show up every day. And that alone will get you a long ways. Mm. The other thing I tell them to do is study the books you love. Mm. Read them once. If you find out you loved them, go back and read it again, but dissect it. Ask yourself how the writer told the story and really study it and then learn from that. And then read another one that you love, but read it to dissect it. Um, very few people take this advice. Very few. Um, the people I know who have taken it are now going to be published writers, including my oldest son. He actually did it. And um, the other thing is do it the same time of day, write at the same time of day every day, and write in the same place as much as you can. And make that place its own place, isolated. You know, I, I know people who write in closets because they need the isolation. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter if you're a novelist or a joke writer or a comedian or whatever. Yeah. It's all the same. Uh, there's a great interview with um, Jerry Seinfeld. And he talks about, they said, what's the number one reason you were successful? He goes, I write every day. Yeah. That's what he yeah. does. And he does it at the same time. You know, and he meditates. Because, you know, being by yourself, writing alone is not good for your mental health. So meditate to get, you know, the boogeyman out of there yeah. and go to work. Same time, same place, every day when you're writing. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, by all means, take time off. But that's that's it. You know, that's the number one piece of advice I can give you. So if you want to work as a writer, work as a writer. like. <laughs> That's do correct. it. No, just get do out it. there and get after it. Man, I, I, yeah. I love this. One of the things I want to just kind of examine, you know, when, I, when I'm talking to someone, I'm interviewing, you know, as a spy, right? I'm talking to people in real time in their space, and I'm trying to understand what truth is and what, you know, what's fiction for them. Not that they're trying to lie to me, but I really want to understand it because then, then I can relay that back to the, to the commander. And uh -huh. I find that when they get emotional, and when they when I get them in the headspace and they can describe clearly, you know, a moment like you were talking earlier about just combat and you skip the moments in between, um, you know, like when they're going from point A to point B. But there's times mm -hmm. along that trail where you stop and everything is crystal clear and, you, and you're not in a combat zone. You're looking at a, a, a red breasted Robin and you can right. remember that Robin down to the finest detail in, into that thing. Sure. Do, do you look for these moments too, where you, where you see the I person do. actually time machine to that location and time? I do. And then I what do. I would do is I would stop and go, give me everything you see and feel and smell and everything, you know? Mm -hmm. That's, ex that's exactly what I do, you yeah. know, and I'm, I'm looking for mostly what the emotional center of that scene is. Yeah. And so if that, I believe that if they're noticing certain things, they're noticing it because they're in a specific specific in, uh, emotional state. And so you can write about it as a reflection of that state, right? So if, yeah. if, if she sees a, a beautiful scene, um, she's seeing it almost as uh, situations in the book where it's, it's like it's an escape, right? Mm. She can see the beauty in something and it's escape from – the terrible ordeal they're going through. But that is what humans are for. We're constantly looking for it if it's, you know, if we're looking for it. And sometimes you're just taken by a thing. There's a there's a, a, a scene in the book that I love where she watches this leaf just kind of tumbling along the ground. And it becomes like a metaphor for their entire existence, that they're they're getting blown around by history here and yet yeah. they have their dreams and they still manage to get all the way to the end. Well, it's just remarkable. Everybody should get the last green Valley and also don't forget to not get also don't skip on uh, beneath the scarlet sky. These are both incredible, incredible stories. When do you, when do you think you'll have the, uh, the African story ready to go? Uh, it's due next year. Oh, okay. In May, so it'll probably be published two years from right now. Okay. Okay. Well, I'd love to have you back on to talk about that. It sounds like such a fascinating book and uh, everybody should definitely yeah. check out, look, anything that Mark does. I mean, he's incredible, but these, these two books that we've profiled here today, I think are just incredible. And I uh, just, it, thanks you for writing them. Thank you for telling these stories and giving us some humanity and also showing us, you know, that if you've been through something like World War II, coming to America and working hard on your dream, that's cake, you know? That's cake. <laughs> it's okay. So Life here is cake. <laughs> yeah.
All right, Eon, stand by. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curated by yours truly. Thank you so much.